Welcome to The Seed. We are so glad you have joined us. I am Julie Staley with Spencer Films. And joining me today is Laura Yar. She's the director over at the Staley Museum. How are you doing today, Laura? Just fine, Julie. How about you? We're all glad that the snow is melting uh, slowly, so that's a good thing. (laughs) Very much so. Very yeah, but so. it's good for, for historians, for people who are uh, digging into history, a uh, good time to uh, just kind of settle down and do a lot of research. Yeah, that's the, that's the upside to this job is when we can't we can't be physically present because of those kind of situations. We can always go home and, and snuggle down with our computers and our research and, and work at home. So that, that is yeah. an upside. Yeah, exactly. Well, we want to thank our uh, partners that help bring us this podcast, the Herald and Review and First Mid Insurance Group and McGuire, Uhas, Huffman and Buckley CPA firms. Uh, we also have two sponsors for this podcast, Viewing Real Estate and also the Staley Credit Union. And we want to thank them for also helping bring this about what we what we like to do on the seat is to, to tell the story of A.E. Staley and the how he built the company, the Staley Manufacturing Company in Decatur, Illinois. We have a documentary that's coming out that Spencer Films is in the middle of p- producing right now. We're kind of in post-production. We're actually full in post-production, and we hope to be announcing distribution very, very soon. Uh, we're actually very close to uh, making some decisions on that. Um, and we're wanting to share stories about making this film about A.E. Staley, about the Staley company, uh, about the city, uh, and about the people that helped build that company. Uh, And we're hoping that this podcast will share those stories and share that history, keep that history alive. Of course, you can see a lot of this history, learn a lot more about it if you go to the Staley Museum over in Decatur. So we hope you can uh, stop by sometime and uh, spend some time uh, sharing uh, the history that we have there and Laura and the staff would be glad to show you around. Um, we haven't had to cl- we had to close for a few days for the snow, but other than that, you're back open again. Yeah, we just closed for a couple of days. Uh, we're we're on some side roads here in Decatur, so sometimes they're not uh, the first streets to get plowed when 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 the the quantity of snow that we had this past week. So sometimes we have to close just to let the the road crews catch up, and then we can open back up. Uh, it's it's a matter of safety, really, for people trying to navigate the streets and the sidewalks. So, yeah, exactly. But we do for for those that are coming. If if you have uh, any assistance that you need, we do have uh, a parking lot in the back, and we have a ramp that you can go up to get in. So we welcome everyone to come in and and take a look at the history and take a look at the stories uh, that are there. So to share some wonderful stories today, we have a guest on today from the uh, Herald and Review. Justin Kahn is joining us, and he's the regional editor of the Herald and Review. Hi, Justin. How are you? Hi, Julie. Hi, Laura. How are you guys? Fine. How are you? Doing well. uh, Dug out of the snow as well. (laughs) Welcome aboard. (laughs) Well, Justin and I had talked um, many months ago about the documentary, and uh, he was able to provide some really wonderful stories uh, from his perspective in working at the Herald and Review, because the Herald and Review has been in the Herald the Herald and the Review, two separate papers, have been around since before all of this. Um, and they were there at the inception. And really, you can chronicle the entire story through the history of the Herald and Review. And that's just really been fascinating here as researchers and, and, and historians as we've tried to uh, uncover more about this story, uh, even more than when we were starting the museum. And you guys have really been able to uh, share a lot about that. Tell me, how it it, how it's been working in that environment where you have so much history available about something that's so prominent in the community yeah really i mean in in, newspapers.com is is definitely an addiction of mine and you know and you know when when we first we we were one of the early newspapers that that did jump in with newspapers.com and now many others have joined as well and you know I, i think it's such a great product for for customers who want to look at you know 
any any old thing. I mean, I used to just when I was a news a, a reporter, I would just go in there and type in, you know, just random keywords and just see what I'd find. And I would always kind of come up with. I, I remember one time I, I typed in ghosts and I found some crazy old ghost story from Decatur and, and uh, did a story on it and, and just many different things I did. And you know, when I became involved with with this project. Um, I did the same thing, you know, A.E. Staley, and the, the, um, just the sheer amount of information was was really incredible, and I think it really speaks to his connection to, with the community, and, you know, I think that, you know, through through this and through um, the, you know, going to the museum and, and the things I saw there, I really, really learned the breadth of what Staley, you know, and I know the, the documentary will uh, dive into that, the breadth of what, you know, he and his company met to not only Decatur in the Midwest of the world, uh, but really to me that that connection with the community of Decatur is really, you know, I, I guess what can, what I find special about A.E. Staley and his story. Can you really and, find and, it in, in newspapers.com? You can find, you know, every detail about this guy's life. He was not shy about sharing, you know, what he was doing. And, and you know, yeah, when he was going out of town, when he was ill, when he had family, you know, coming into town, all that was always reported on the pages of the Herald and the Review and later on the Herald and Review. Yes, yes, exactly. Laura, you guys found that uh, through working with the museum. Absolutely. Um, you know, when we started working at the museum, newspaper.com was relatively new. Um, and, and a lot of newspapers were just starting to upload materials to the, to the site. But yes, we did that with, with Herald and Review. Herald Re and Review was instrumental to helping us get things off the ground, giving us permission, kind of, you know, open permission to use photographs that we had that, uh, or that we had access to, some of which came to us through Tate and Lyle, but were clearly stamped Herald and Review to be able to use in our, in our exhibits and, and storytelling. Um, you know, a local newspaper, and in this case, the Herald and Review, or the Herald and the Review, um, you know, really are a link to how the story that we're trying to tell um, connects to the community. So it's, it's, it's a gold mine of information and, and a very valuable service. Now, one thing that uh, when people hear about this story is, how did he get from you know, a young boy growing up barefoot on a farm in North Carolina to creating this empire? Uh, and you know, the company still exists today, uh, has different owners, but you know, still exists and is uh, you know, b bigger than ever. How did, how did he bridge that gap? And a lot of it, as you'll see, uh, if you know the story, and as you'll see in the documentary, was being able to persuade people uh, to do many, many things. Uh, he had a real gift of charming people and persuading people, but he had to be able to in, in, persuade people to invest their money. And back then, that was a lot more risky than even today because you didn't always have the assurances that, that you do today uh, with where your money is going. Um, and so, Justin, if you can talk a little bit about that, about how he, what character, characteristics he had to persuade people to to invest in you know really he, he the times he had you know that there were times that it didn't look good for him and he still was able to talk people into investing um with him i mean and really you know when you kind of look at every stage of his um you know growth and, and um and emergence that was sort of he was always able to at least convince people of his vision and i think to do that you have to have a vision and I, so I think that that's, that was a big part of it. I think he always, you know, had a, a strong vision and, you know, he had a big personality, a big guy with a big personality. We've talked about that a lot with, with A.E. Staley. And I think for whatever, and, and, and there is something maybe that is tough to put into words or what it is exactly about him that people, that they wanted to be on his team. You know, they wanted to be, he got people to, to see his vision or he got people to see his vision and, and really wanted to just be part of it. And, you know, it's really amazing how often he was able to do that. And if definitely if you could bottle that or teach a class, you know, that was that would be uh, the way to go for sure. I'd like to jump in here on 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 the topic of his investors, because I think another thing that's really extraordinary about A.E. Staley and what he achieved in this area of, of convincing people to go along uh, is the fact that so many of his investors weren't people who would typically be investors. Um, yeah. Aside from the fact that you might have bankers and and people. Uh 
you know, a fan like the grocers and and uh, and business owners that he was selling his products to to invest in in the possibility of a larger manufacturing plant. And I think one of the reasons he was able to do that was because he was from humble beginnings himself. I think he knew how to talk the talk of of the average man and um, and bring them along with him in his in his plans. I mean, you, yeah, you people really, that. really trusted him. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. You can see that throughout his, you know, throughout his career, his connection with, you know, the average, the average guy, the average worker, the average man. I think he was definitely a, a man of the people, which, you know, I think that, you know, you can stereotypically kind of let that, the, you know, the big corporate guy, you know, usually has sort of that, you know, personality where, where you know, the workers and that, that's a, you know, a contrarian um relationship but not with not with Staley he was definitely you know you were rare to find any reports you know of people I mean I'm sure that's going to happen but there were very few reports of people being unhappy with him and he was really just in general uh someone who connected with people yeah you're right there really wasn't that uh blue collar versus white collar situation at all it was really truly kind of the the larger Staley family um and that included you know, Staley himself and all the people that were a part of making his dream come true. I mean, he recognized that later on uh, when he when he built his office building, you know, he 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 dedicated that office building to not only his customers that made his business, but also those his employees that really, um, you know, made it all happen. I mean, without them, he would he wouldn't have been able to, you know, even get out the gate. So. And that office building was the start of an endeavor that A.E. Staley, uh, uh, an idea he had to give more financial security to his employees through the Staley Credit Union. Um, and, and basically, he asked the question, you know, what if what if you owned your bank? What if you owned your bank? Well, if you joined the Staley Credit Union, you will. And when you're a credit union member, profits come back to you, not the investors. And how is that? How does that happen? Well, if you think lower interest rates on loans, higher dividends on savings, financial education, and unmatched member services. So if you can become a member today, you just have to visit StaleyCU.com. And this institution is not federally insured by member choice. It's proudly insured by the American Share Insurance. And that started when the uh, that credit union began when the Herald or um, the the uh, administration building went went up, and it is not affiliated with the company any longer. It is uh, on its own, but uh, still exists today, and uh, they still have members, and they are still going strong. So that really says a lot about a vision that he had for creating a financial stability for his employees. And, and you know, and another thing you know is, is it amazing is that 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 name stays around and Staley, that Staley name is still hooked to so many things, you know, in Decatur. And, and it, it, you know, the funny thing is, you know, I, I'm a, a transplant, I'm not from Decatur. Anybody who's from Decatur, if you ask them about Staley, the, oh, oh yeah, my uncle or my so-and-so oh, worked there. Everybody that's lived here for a long time always has that story. But for, for us, like, you know, first transplants, Julie and myself among them, you know, you kind of get so a little piece by piece. And, you know, my first piece of it was, I was a sports reporter and it was the Staley Day game. And this was in 2007, 2008 still, they were still calling it the Staley Day game. And I'm like, what is Staley? <laughs> and, and you know, somebody explained, oh, well, it's, it's what Tate Lyle used to be called. And I remember just thinking at the time, well, that's, you know, that's really, that must've really had, you know, it's just strange to me, you know? And at first I kind of filed, filed it away. And then, you know, you learn the history of the, of the bears <laughs> and then you start going, okay, this is, you know, a really major character, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, as time goes by, you know, this daily viaduct, you drive over that and you're like, oh, okay. And then this daily credit union. And then you learn about Lake Decatur and just the, the sheer amount of things that, you know, really what Decatur became, you know, was directly a result of, of A.E. Staley and what it still is, is, I mean, it definitely still has a, a huge imprint on this community. 
Yeah, he had a real vision for a lot of a lot of different things uh, uh, for his employees and for his company and for the city. And he didn't know it at the time, but it has created a rich history. And there's another company in town that uh, shares a lot of history and really appreciates the the history that uh, is in Decatur. Viewing real estate, they're proud to support Decatur and its rich history. They not only help people buy and sell residential and commercial real estate, they enjoy connecting them with the community we all love. Decatur and Central Illinois have much to offer anyone who chooses to reside here, and Viewing Real Estate is ready to help you find and buy that dream home or business. So you can find out more at viewingrealestate.com. Viewing Real Estate, they're working hard so you don't have to. So that sounds good. And uh, A.A. Staley was always working hard for his company for his employees. They were like family to him. So we mentioned the Staley Credit Union. He put that in place for his employees. Uh, he provided all kinds of uh, things throughout uh, the years for for everyone to enjoy, uh, not only at work, but outside of work. And one of, one of the most exciting things, and I know Justin really in, enjoys uh, this topic, is the Staley Picnic. Uh, that was a, a huge shindig that went on for years. And made a lot of headlines uh, in the Herald Review. It did. It, it was really, a, you know, an annual thing. It, it, it started out, you know, kind of a like a you know a, a company picnic, like you kind of would think of. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. I mean, it went, you know, two thousand people, four thousand. I think that uh, five thousand people even. And I mean, it really um, just got bigger and bigger. And there was food and ice cream, and there were activities for. I mean. Anything you were interested in, there were, you know, athletics and, and dances and um, dinner and, and, and all that. So, I mean, it was, it was a really full day affair. I mean, honestly, at the end of this day, I would have been <laughs> dead tired. I can't even imagine. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're talking about outside pretty much, you know, it, it, the day stuff was all outside. This is summertime. So they're outside, you know, doing activities, eating ice cream, you know, drinking soda. And then you know the the night activity was usually um, you know dinner and dancing and things like that. So really, just an, an incredible event. And you know, like anything you know that great, eventually it just got too big. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think I want to say um, the uh, the Herald, the Decatur Herald, reported um, seventy five hundred at one of them. And there was a there was an incident at, at a soda stand where they it was really hot and they ran out of soda and. You know, some people started getting angry and things like that. But um, I, I think that that one at that point, they said, well, maybe this maybe we need to scale this back a little bit because, you know, you started getting, you know, everybody in the community involved, not just, you know, the, the Staley people. So um, but really um, a fantastic event. And I mean, the cost of this thing had to be incredible because, you know, there were late in it, too. They were also serving beer at it and, you know, food and ice cream for everybody. So, I mean, really. Um, I know, I'm sure that, you know, you, 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 if you told somebody, you know, at, at a workplace now, hey, we're going to do this this year, that would, people would be like, wow. Well, and I think, know, Laura, am I correct that he footed the bill for some of that or most yeah, of that? Well, it was, it was, uh, it was actually put together by the Staley Fellowship Club, which was something that uh, had started in 1919. And the fellowship club was obviously supported by the company. Also, dues were charged, but the dues that were charged were so minimal they could have never footed the bill for something this this large. So, so yeah, he. I'm sure that the company had you know had to, and especially when you take to con into consideration that part of the reason the, the the numbers started to grow at the company picnics were that not only were employees and their family members being uh, being invited, but uh, public officials, uh, customers of of you know important customers to the manufacturing company the more people that got involved got involved and got invited to the, to the picnic obviously the company was going to have to step in and help foot the bill for that by all means initially it was a, it was it was a very small thing um, main, mainly for employees and their families but it was something that kind of grew and took on a life of its own and I think the company saw it as a an, another way to have relationships with customers and uh, government officials and city officials and things like that. So yeah, um, yeah, exactly. It, it uh, went on for, I'm sorry, Lori, it went on for about 20 years, right? I mean, it was it was a long. It went on pretty much until World War II. Um, after World War II. 
To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure whether they picked that back up or if it was something that kind of faded to the back, to the background. My favorite company picnic story, though, um, and you may have read about this, Justin, in, in, in the newspaper, was, um, you know, in 1930, when the office building was going to be inaugurated, they decided to uh, have the, have the uh, one of the aspects that was going to be so amazing about the office building was this exterior light show. Um, that you read about all the time in the newspapers and, and, and in the Herald and Review. And this light show, the first evening that these lights were going to be turned on, were timed so that um, it would go, it would correspond with the Staley Picnic, which was happening over in Nelson Park, and uh, the opening, the grand opening of Lakeshore Drive, which was the new road that was going to, you know, go around our, our lake, which we'd only had for about, you know, eight years by that time. So Lakeshore Drive was going to be opened. The Staley Picnic was happening in Nelson Park. And just as the, tra the first cars came around on, on Lakeshore Drive, um, the lights went on on the office building. And I'm sure it was kind of one of those ooh, ah moments. Mm. Um, but, you know, what I mean by that, and I guess what I want to say by that is Staley just had this sixth sense on how to put all of these things together so that they became even more meaningful. You know, he something special that he's doing with his office building, something special he's doing for the employee, something special that's going on in the city of Decatur. And he brings them all together and it just kind of, um, you know, is out there. I mean, it's it's the Midas touch is the only way I can respond. It's the only way I can describe it. Yeah, he definitely had that with every everything. I mean, really everything that uh, he came in contact with. Uh, one of the other very memorable and still, uh, you know, still legendary, still part of history uh, uh, pieces of the company were, of course, uh, the athletics, the athletic program, which was part of the Staley Fellowship Club. That's where they all got started. Um, and what I find in very interesting about that whole topic, uh, Justin, is what you and I have talked about about how the Herald review had to cover all of this and, and the Staley Journal was covering and there was so much coverage going on of sports because of the Staley Manufacturing Company. Absolutely. I mean, there, there were, I mean, there were pages and pages dedicated at times to all the different sports. I mean, people, kind of, you know, obviously want to talk about, you know, the, the football team, but it was, it was lots of, I mean, there were, you know, softball obviously was a huge thing indicator for a long time. And that was, you know, a big one. And, you know, obviously baseball and, and you know, just, it was, uh, you know, and he was such a huge baseball fan. And it, it is funny how he kind of got, you know, um, it, it, football became sort of what he was known for, but yeah. I mean, really it, it, the, the um, it, it had, it had to keep the sports writers busy at that time. And it was very helpful. There was, um, you know, the Staley's had their own uh, journal as well that they were able to, uh, that, 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 definitely helped out a lot. And I remember looking at, you know, looking for some of those where they would run every result from every game in those things. So, um, yeah, the, the, the sports program was, was fantastic. It really was. And isn't yeah, the Staley it, journal, I'm sorry, go ahead, Laura. I'm just, I was just going to say, and isn't it great, um, that you guys have that information and that that information is preserved because look at, look at that, because here we are now, you know, almost a hundred years later, or exactly a hundred years later, really, and able to go back and look at that stuff and make sense of, you know, not only what was happening at Staley, but what was happening in the world of football. I mean, football was becoming, you know, at, at that point in time, it was just an industrial league sport. And it was going right there before our very eyes with the Staley, the Decatur Staley's, and then their move to Chicago. We're watching the NFL kind of blossom and take on a whole, you know, a whole new significance in, in our in our in our nation's history. I, it's it's one of the ways that the Staley story connects to something larger than Decatur, and it, it, it's it, outside it, it, of the realm of Decatur. It, it's you know it's I mentioned earlier you know the, the first you drive into town you see that home of the Chicago Bears sign and I remember the first time going. Did I know that? <laughs> you know, like, like is that? And I'm, talking, I'm a big sports fan. You know, I'm sitting there going, oh, okay, you know, and and um, you know, and then as, as you dive into it, you're, it's a really, it's an incredible story. And you know, I, I like to think also about the what ifs. You know, what if he hadn't sold the, you know, the team? Yeah. And you know, he was such a strong personality that you wonder if if maybe it would have affected the whole you know um, history of the NFL and, and what it became. And um, so, really, it, it's it's fascinating to think about all that stuff. And then. It's also equally fascinating to think about that, you know, this is this was, you know, uh, obviously his legacy that that 
a lot of people know about it. And, and you know, we've talked about before, you know, the, the Bears and, you know, Bears fans, this is sort of a, I think you guys talked about it in the um, last podcast, it's sort of being a, a Mecca. But, you know, then when you start realizing all the things he did, the reason he left, you know, left that behind, you know, the, the sports program behind was to, you know, we need to focus on, you know, the company and stuff and what we do in this company. And then, you know, obviously the success that the company, you know, had even after that and, and you know, the all the innovations and, and everything that happened after that. And you go, the, the Bears were such a small part of, you know, the Cater Stanley's were such a small part of what, what, you know, this guy was about that, you know, it, it is, it's funny how that is such an outsized, you know, thing because of, you know, Stanley the Bear and, and all that, but it, it's still, um, you know, really kind of a footnote and, and, and a really great footnote, but still. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. It is a footnote for, for the, as far as museum stories go, it is a footnote, but it does, um, I think one of the reasons I'm so grateful about the Bears story or the Decatur Staley story or, or the football story, however you want to term it, is that um, that particular story brings an entire group of people, a new group of people to a museum environment that might not otherwise come to a museum like of this kind. So th there's lots of ways to bring people in and make them a part of your story. So I'm very grateful that we have this this sports story uh, that reaches out to a whole different you know community of visitors that we might not see otherwise here at the museum. It, it definitely, I mean, honestly, it, it really brought me in. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a local history enthusiast, but I'm all, you know, sports is, my, is sort of my main, you know, is, is my job. So um, I, I do, that is kind of what brought me in originally as well. So I can definitely relate to that. Yeah, it, it's history that uh, really has kind of helped uh, melt, you know, meld people together. And uh, um, if you're new to town, it uh, it links you, it links you uh, in already. And uh, uh, something, yeah. Now a hundred years later, we're still, you know, enjoying the stories and the legacy. Yeah. Of course, the uh, Chicago Bears came down to Decatur before the pandemic, uh, luckily, uh, yeah. and celebrated the 100th anniversary. And uh, the museum was a part of that. They visited. Some of them visited the museum. Uh, they were at the Civic Center. Uh, we were all so grateful to have them come down and come back home uh, to celebrate. Uh, so, yeah, they kind of came full circle. And uh, and that was really another nice part of history. So we're still making history in Decatur uh, with them. The pride the community takes in that, too, I think is really special. I mean, I really, you know, other communities in, in Illinois of this size, there's Bears fans, but you'll get other teams you know sort of pockets of teams that people root for indicator good luck finding someone who's not a bears fan <laughs> I mean, exactly. it is it's really, a tough life it, it's it's a it, it's a tough life and i always joke about you know with the what, what if part maybe they had gotten a good quarterback by now if if uh <laughs> staley still uh was involved but yeah i mean it, it just don't, i love the pride the cater takes in and you know the, the the big mural that has been put up in the last few years over on uh maine it is beautiful and really i know that that's something that the caterers take pride in yes jerry johnson uh wonderful yeah. job with that uh you know uh, i'd like yeah. to i'd like to interject something here very quickly and this is a very selfish i, I have a very selfish motivation for this um because justin khan is here and he's with the newspaper and he loves uh, local history and he seems to enjoy doing research we have another um, mile mark mile marking date this year here in the Staley story um, this this year marks the 100th anniversary of Staley's pioneering the production of soybeans uh, he started on September 22nd 1922 and so here we are uh, coming up on that in September. We, here at the museum, we hope to uh, be creating stories and talking about that throughout the year, not just, on, not, not just in September. And we're talking with some other um, entities that are involved in the soybean uh, industry and things to see if they might want to uh, participate with us in celebrating this 100th anniversary. But when, when, when you spoke, Justin, about um, the football story being such a small part of the whole Staley story. The soybean story is a huge part of the Staley story. Oh yeah. And in in many ways it is 
probably one of the main reasons he didn't carry on with the football program because exactly. his focus was moving towards starting this whole this this dream industry, which was the processing of soybeans. So I invite you, Justin, on on board as 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 a research partner with me uh, to help help the museum here in the community celebrate this milestone of this 2022 100th anniversary of soybean processing. Yeah, that would be great. And, you know, it's really amazing. You know, that I think that the whole the soybean um, aspect of, of um, Staley is probably the part that I really had, you know, and I knew the bear story. I knew about his connection to the community. But then, you know, you grow. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in, in Illinois and grew up with soybean fields everywhere and always just thought that was just the way it had always been, you know. And then well, I learned that at your museum. I, it was not that long ago, even probably within the last couple of years, I was at your museum and I'm reading this and I'm like, what? That, that that's that they weren't that wasn't a crop before and and, and or a major crop in, in Illinois before or, you know before I was really I found that just amazing that that was it just felt like you know growing up that was just the way it always had been and you know they're, they're, that, that's why I start seeing the breadth of it wasn't they, just Decatur it wasn't just this he he changed the entire way our land in the Midwest looks you're mm -hmm. you're absolutely right and he. Uh, uh, it, you know, he, there were pockets of people interested in soybean production in other areas of the United States, um, in, including North Carolina, which is where he's from. But it, it hadn't reached Illinois and the Midwest yet. And that was where uh, Staley's role really was going to was going to be important. It just takes one. And in, in lucky for us, it was Mr. Staley because he had the, uh, you know, the persistence and the resources and the drive to uh, to make that happen uh, for the Midwest, and here we are, you know, 100 years later, um, we've often been referred to as the breadbasket of the world. There's a reason for that. Yeah, it's been wonderful that we can still, a hundred years later, share these stories and have so much pride in them. And we still have, uh, you know, the company is still still running, and uh, you know, so so many more families and generations of families are working there, uh, doing the same jobs that were done decades ago and generations ago. So, Justin, we are so grateful for you joining us and for the Herald and Review partnering with us uh, on this project for the documentary, and uh, you know, helping out in the museum in, in, in any way that uh, you've been able to. So thank, thank you so much for everything. I'm honored to be part of it. And I know the Herald Review uh, is definitely honored to be a uh, part of this and just cannot wait huh, to see the final product. I know that, uh, that I'm sure you hear that all the time, Julie, and just really uh, excited to be a part of it. And I think that is great that we're telling the story. Thank you so much. Yes, I can't wait to see it either. We want, we're ready. We're ready to get it out there. Believe me, I'm the first person in line to want to see it uh, come out. So we will be making an announcement on this podcast when we know about our distribution. It is coming soon. We are uh, discussing it. So we will have uh, uh, much, much more ahead. Uh, and looking ahead for our next podcast, uh, that will drop on March 1st. And Laura and I will welcome Lana Wildman. She is is our archivist and researcher for Spencer Films, and she has been the, the lead researcher for us uh, at, uh, at, at, at looking for all the information, all of the background uh, that we need, and ferreting out, uh, going down all these rabbit holes uh, uh, for information uh, to verify and uh, look up details on stories that we're telling in the uh, documentary. And what she's going to talk about, actually, uh, we're going to talk about some stories that she found out that we didn't know about. Uh, mm -hmm. There were quite a bit of few things that we were like, oh, we had no idea. And well, so excited. you can imagine <laughs> the many of them, we just didn't have time to put into the document. They're like 17 more documentaries. <laughs> so we were like, wow, how can we share this with the public? Well, we will be sharing some of them at the museum as, as time goes on. We'll be opening up some new things, new information. But uh, Lana will be here to talk about a few things a uh, few interesting tidbits uh, that we'd like everyone to uh, to learn about. So uh, we look forward to that. That'll be on March the 1st. And we also thank our sponsors, Viewing Real Estate and the Staley Credit Union. And of course, our partners, First Mid Insurance and McGuire U.S. Huffman and Buckley CPA Firm for also partnering with this. And the Herald and Review, Staley Museum, Spencer Films. We all thank you for joining and we will see you next time or have you listen next time. Take care. <laughs>